On a rainy night, a van speeds down the road, attracting the attention of police officers. Pulling the van over, officers find a suspicious injured woman behind the wheel who says she forgot her driver's license in another dress. She doesn't respond to an offer to go outside, and the back of the van turns out to be full of dogs. A phone call wakes up a psychiatrist named Evelyn. The woman is urgently called to work, because of which she has to leave her child in the care of her mother. Evelyn goes to the police station to conduct an evaluation of the detainee. The patient turns out to be a van driver in a wheelchair who is smoking next to the window. A fresh wound is visible on her back. When the suspect turns around, it becomes clear that it is not a woman, but a man in makeup and a wig. Evelyn explains that her job is to determine what to do with him. The detainee introduces himself as Douglas. When asked if he has children, he says he has hundreds, implying his dogs. To explain where he gets his affection for animals, Douglas dives into flashbacks of his childhood. He grew up in a typical religious redneck family that raised dogs for fighting. Dad was a real dictator with a penchant for sadism. Douglas' older brother was also quite blunt and cruel. Mom loved her youngest son, but she didn't dare argue with her husband. Little Douglas loved his father's dogs and fed them, against his dad's inhibitions, who wanted hungry and angry dogs for fighting. Having learned from his eldest son that Douglas violates the prohibition, the father decides on radical educational methods. He locks the boy in a cage with dogs, because dogs are dearer to Douglas than his own father. Animals warm their new neighbor by covering him with their own furry bodies. Soon mom runs away from the inhospitable home while pregnant. She wants to raise the new baby under normal conditions. Finally, she hands over several cans of canned food to Douglas, who is constantly living in a cage. So the boy survived the winter without even trying to escape. He had nowhere to go anyway. Evelyn returns home in the morning, where she learns from her mother that her ex-husband, who was forbidden by the court to come near their house, is somewhere nearby, wanting to see his son. Douglas once again indulges in reminiscing at the police station. One day, his older brother put a sign on the cage that read Dogman on the inside. Shortly before his arrest, Douglas is visited by a teenage boy named Juan, who brings a puppy that had been thrown out on the street. Juan asks for help. Marta, the owner of the local laundromat, is constantly being bullied by the gangster El Verdugo, not only taking all her profits, but forcing the woman to sell her own clothes. Douglas promises to help. Disguised as a woman in a black morning dress, he follows El Verdugo. The bandit arrives at the bar where his gang is located. At Douglas' command, a small dog runs in there with a phone in its teeth. The dog takes the phone to the gangster's leader by jumping on a table. Curiosity takes over and El Verdugo answers the phone. Douglas, while commanding the bigger dog, makes the criminal an offer he can't refuse. The gangster must leave Martha alone, and in return Douglas will allow the evil dog to loosen his grip. El Verdugo has to agree to this. The first dog, having received the phone back, runs away. The second dog rushes after him. The leader tells his subordinates to follow the dogs, but they are nowhere to be seen. Evelyn, arguing on the phone with her ex-husband about the ban on approaching the house, visits Douglas's home, which resembles a battlefield. There are bullet marks everywhere. Grabbing his things, the woman returns to the cell to learn the further history of the detainee and make a final verdict. The first thing the psychiatrist is interested in is how the man came to be imprisoned in a cage with dogs. One day, his older brother noticed the puppies Douglas was hiding and reported them to his father. When the father went outside with a gun, the boy blocked his way into the cage, growling at his dad. The dogs joined Douglas's rebellion, gnawing on the bars of the cage with their teeth. Dad accidentally fires a shotgun, and the shot knocks Douglas to the ground. The older brother takes the father into the house and tosses the younger brother a handkerchief to bandage the shot finger on his hand. As the father prays and leaves, little Douglas has a plan. He stuffs the shot finger into a bag and tells one of the dogs to carry it to the police car like the one on the cover of the magazine. The dog gets out into the hole he chewed earlier and runs away. The dog runs through the streets for a long time before he finds the right car and, jumping on the hood, puts the package with the finger in it. The officers, seeing the bloody finger, immediately take action. The cops break into the house, arrest the father and the oldest son, then call an ambulance for the caged child. That day, Douglas lost the ability to walk normally. The bullet that took away his finger ricocheted off the wall and lodged in his spine. Doctors didn't risk removing it to avoid damaging his spinal cord. Now every step could dislodge a lodged bullet and literally be Douglas' last. His father ended up going to prison for 20 years. He committed suicide two weeks after his arrest. 
His brother was sentenced to 12 years, but he got out early for good behavior after eight years. One of the dogs waited for him outside the jail, then chased him down the street. The dog was joined by several other dogs in the chase until they cornered the man. The dogs lunged at him, and... Douglas never told the psychiatrist how his older brother died. By law, Evelyn must report if she learns of a murder involving a patient. After being released from a cage with dogs, Douglas was placed in an orphanage where he was unable to make friends with anyone. Children are less friendly than dogs, and no one wanted to play with a disabled person. But the boy met the librarian Salma, in whom he fell in love at first sight. The girl addicted him to reading Shakespeare and performing in the theater circle, where they staged plays by the British classic. Also Salma taught him to use makeup, cosmetics, and change clothes to reincarnate in other people. The theater performances made little Douglas happy and moderately popular. Soon Salma left the orphanage, going to perform on Broadway. Douglas collected in a scrapbook newspaper clippings of her successes. As an adult, he attended her performance, and after the performance went backstage to talk in person. To his surprise, Salma recognized him and was happy to meet. Douglas handed her a scrapbook through which he had followed the actor's career. The woman really liked the gift, after which a man enters the dressing room. This is the director of the play, Salma's husband and the future father of her child. Saddened by this news, Douglas says goodbye and goes to the dog shelter where he works. Despairing at the realization that he is not going to be happy with his first love, Douglas releases his anger with an outburst of rage, for which he even rises to his feet. The dogs in the enclosures bark and howl with him. The dogs break out of their cages, flank the fallen boy and, as when he was a child, warm their bodies, licking his face in a fit of pure and sincere love. Douglas acts like a real broken-hearted woman and cuts his hair shorter. But trouble doesn't come alone. The authorities want to shut down the dog shelter to save the budget. Douglas reminds representatives of the mayor's office that the shelter lives off donations, and the only municipal funding they have is for the building. But therein lies the problem. They want to give the site to a developer to make money. The guy is given until Monday to get out. Over the weekend, Douglas moves into an abandoned laboratory at the local college with all the pets, where he carefully reads Shakespeare to them. However, it takes money to feed so many hungry dogs. He is looking for work and goes to interviews as actively as his condition allows. But everywhere he gets a polite rejection. No one wants a wheelchair user. One day, having got into a cabaret on one vacancy, Douglas notices a rehearsal of singing travesti, men in women's costumes. Remembering the performances in the theater of the orphanage, the guy offers himself as a performer. The owner is skeptical of the idea, but Douglas gets up from his wheelchair to dispel his doubts. He can perform standing up without spoiling the visitor's mood with his unhealthy appearance. The collective of painted singers chorus asks for the guy, and the boss, yielding to persuasion, finally agrees. Soon Douglas makes up in the dressing room, preparing for his debut. Colleagues support him, roll his wheelchair to the middle of the stage, and help him stand up, so that when the curtain rises, he appeared in all his glory in front of the microphone. Douglas exemplarily performs a French song. Admiring colleagues do not immediately realize after the end of the number to close the curtain and roll up a wheelchair for the tired artist. Making sure that the newcomer coped, the owner includes him in the Friday program. Evelyn asks what else he's been doing besides his singing career. Douglas admits to helping people solve their safety issues by matching them with the right pet. He says that the dogs obeyed him unconditionally and understood him perfectly. When he cooked dinner, they served him the right ingredients on demand. After discovering this amazing gift, Douglas began to use the dogs for other purposes. He taught the dogs to steal jewelry from the homes of the rich. Finding a loophole in the house, the four-legged friends would climb inside and scour the space for what they could carry in their teeth. Such disrespect for private property attracts the interest of the insurance company, which is obliged to compensate for the value of the stolen goods. To find out, insurance investigator Ackerman is dispatched to one victim. After questioning the homeowner and wondering why the watchdogs haven't raised a bark, he takes the hard drive containing the surveillance footage and goes to watch it. Sitting in front of the monitors, Ackerman rewinds the videotape several times until they notice a dog flickering on it. The dog sneaks onto the property, plays with the dogs guarding the house, then climbs into the house and pulls the precious necklace out of there. Recalling a similar incident, Ackerman asks to see the footage from the street cameras. Long and painstaking labor is rewarded. They see the same doggy. Ackerman finds a video of a parked van where the dog comes running in and is driven by someone in a wheelchair. 
After figuring out the license plate number, the investigator finds the culprit, but is in no hurry to turn him in to the police. Instead, admiring the man's talent, he goes to a club where a cross-dressing Douglas is performing. After the performance, Ackerman goes into the dressing room to thank the singer and invite him to dinner. Douglas politely declines, believing he is dealing with a pervert. What Douglas doesn't realize is that the insurance man follows him all the way to his house, after which he infiltrates his territory. What Ackerman himself doesn't know is about the security cameras near the house. Douglas commands the pets to prepare for the intruder, who threatens his master with a gun, revealing his true nature. Ackerman needs the stolen jewelry to enrich himself personally. Douglas tells him the code to the safe in the closet where the box of stolen jewelry lies. Afterward, Ackerman is about to leave, but the host offers to stay for dinner. The investigator agrees, not suspecting that he will soon become the main course for a dozen dogs, which, having surrounded Ackerman, on command rush at the uninvited guest. The story doesn't end there. One Friday afternoon, while Douglas was dressing up as Marilyn Monroe for a performance, El Verdugo thugs broke into the hideout. They tracked down Juan and, by torture, forced him to turn in Martha's laundry defender. Arriving on the scene, the bandit leader kills the hapless Juan while his thugs spread out around the building. Hearing a gunshot, Douglas gives the dogs the command, War, and he arms himself with a shotgun. The cunning dogs lure the uninvited guests into prepared traps. One is electrocuted when he steps into a puddle of water, another is simply mauled by the dogs. The next bandit falls into a covered pit trap, another villain is pushed into the pit by a dog, and a third falls into a trap made with a rope. Resiliently overcoming the pain, Douglas gets up from his wheelchair to help his pets. He shoots the gangsters in the pit and hits the enemies by accurately firing through the walls. The remaining gangsters manage to wound Douglas. The wounded Douglas crawls away while El Verdugo arms himself with a machine gun and continues to crumble the walls into dust. The bandit leader chases Douglas through the empty corridors and finds him sitting in a chair. With his makeup smudged with sweat, the entertainer becomes hysterical. El Verdugo pulls the trigger but is out of ammunition. Douglas raises his glass, commanding the dogs, and they lunge at the intruder. Later, smoking in the back of a police car, Douglas tells the officer that the dogs are his children. With a nod, he commands the dogs, and they scatter out of the back of the truck. The story goes back to the police station. Evelyn says she has no questions but the last one. Why did he confide in her? The detainee replies that they are united by pain. Leaving the station, the psychiatrist doesn't notice the dog on duty across the street, which rallies the others with its howl, barely a woman drives away. Douglas smokes and smiles, after which he shaves and changes into a business suit. The dogs, meanwhile, infiltrate the station and frighten the duty officer, causing him to fall, losing consciousness. After taking the keys from the unconscious policeman, the dogs bring them under the master's cell door. Douglas, in his wheelchair, rides out of the cell into the foyer and sees the rising sun just above the church across the street. He gets out of the wheelchair and staggers outside toward the church. Stopping in the shadow of the cross, the man turns to God, telling him that he loves him and that he is ready. Moments later, Douglas falls, emitting his last breath. The bullet lodged in the man's body struck his vital organs and killed him. A multitude of devoted dogs surround the body of their dead master, saying goodbye to him forever. At this time, Evelyn, nursing her baby, looks out the window. She sees a dog lying in front of the house. It is the last greeting from Douglas, meant to protect the woman from her aggressive ex-husband.